Recording in progress. Very good. So. Okay. This is the usual slide, as you know. Ah, let me. Let's not make the same mistake as yesterday. You can see the slide and also the cursor, no? The, the pointer, yes. whatever you want. Word. Fantastic. Okay, so good morning, everybody. That's good afternoon for you. It's morning for me. Uh, this is the, our last lecture. And for the last lecture, I've thought of something that's, um, I could say it's slightly more advanced in the sense that it's a research topic. It's something that I have done quite recently last year. But on the other end, it's very basic. And we will see how and why it is very basic in, in, in the following slides. I believe this lecture should be quite short, so there will be room for a lot of questions. But let's see how it goes as I uh, unfold it. Anyway, you can ask questions at any moment during the lecture. I wanted to say that I will try to go to a, a particularly slow pace today. And uh, this lecture has always to do with long-range interacting system, as usual. And we are in the quantum limit. The first lecture, we have talked about uh, the equilibrium of strong long-range interacting system. So the equilibrium of quantum system with alpha smaller than d, and in particular smaller than 1, because you know that I like to make examples in one dimensions, which are, in my opinion, simpler, but which can often be generalized in any dimension. And on the second lecture, so the lecture of yesterday, we have focused a little bit on the case of alpha larger than d, so alpha larger than 1. And I've, I've tried to show you um, how the, the presence of a long-range interaction term modifies the scaling behavior of, uh, of a spin system, but also of a quantum gas, yielding critical exponents, which are different from the expectation for uh, short range interacting or nearest neighbor interacting systems. And also try to show you how the different regimes for the critical exponents emerge and how can we uh, depict this or can we can try to uh, determine this exponent with via different approximation techniques. So today we are going back to the case of strong long range interacting systems. So to the case of alpha smaller than the dimension D but we are focusing on the case of dynamical evolution. So quantum dynamics of uh, long range interacting systems. And as usual, I'm gonna use as an example, the Ising model that you know, it's my favorite model and it's my favorite model because it's connected with all of these experiments that you see here, as I tried to argue in the first lecture, all of these experiment in certain regimes can be related or mapped into a quantumizing Hamiltonian. So I go back to the quantumizing Hamiltonian, so the icing with ferromagnetic long-range interactions. As I, so Vij is power law decaying with alpha, and alpha now is, so and now we see what happens as a function of alpha when we study the dynamics. This, I don't need to comment so much on this. We already seen yesterday, you remember, there is the case of weak long range interaction, so alpha larger than the dimension in which we don't need any cuts rescaling. And indeed this prefactor is just a, a constant, it's just a number. And instead there is also the case of strong long range interaction alpha smaller than one in which we need a cuts rescaling which depends on the system size and is the number of spin in the chain and uh, in order to have an extensive internal energy. The dynamics that I want to study, it's a very simple one, but since I imagine that not many of you have, uh, have, uh, have experience with quantum dynamics and with especially many body quantum systems dynamics, I will try to go very slow. And I, so I am really asking you to ask questions to, to tell me wherever you are not following. So the idea is to study a phenomenon which is very celebrated in long-range interacting system and which Stefano knows and probably talked to you about, which is the one of quasi-stationary states. 
So quasi-stationary states are dynamical states in the sense that they are not equilibrium states, but their lifetime, so once the system enters in such states, it, it, it stays in there for a very long time. So basically this quasi-stationary state is a concept that we use to, to refer to the fact that long range interacting systems, strong long range interacting systems, they do not like to equilibrate. When we pose them out of equilibrium, they stay out of equilibrium for a very long time. And normally this long time, which is the lifetime of the quasi-stationary states, grows with the system size. So when we make the system larger and larger, it tends to stay more and more time out of equilibrium. How can we... Um, so this is a concept that is very well known in classical long range physics. Stefan has worked a lot on it. Many other people have worked on it, but there is also the case, the, the analogous behavior, it's also observed in quantum long range system. And I'm gonna make you a simple example. The simple example was spelled out first by Michael Kastner in this, in this physical review letter that you see here, this reference. But the example is so simple that I believe everybody can uh, understand it. It's, it's an icing model, and the icing model is prepared at equilibrium at, in a state where um, at very high magnetic field. Okay, so basically, we start with our icing model, which has a very strong magnetic field in such a way that basically it doesn't feel any contribution for the from the interaction term and all the spins are aligned with the transverse magnetic field spin, um, magnetic field. So all the spins basically are independent on each other. The, the state is a product state of independent spins and all the spins are aligned with the magnetic field because they, they want to align with it because it's very strong. So basically the magnetization at the, at the initial time of the dynamics, so when T is going to zero, you see here, the, the magnetization is basically one. Everybody is magnetized, the system is polarized along the magnetic field axis. At this point, we do what it's referred in the literature of many body quantum systems as a sudden quench. So we abruptly change the Hamiltonian from the initial value where the system was laying at equilibrium to a new Hamiltonian, where the magnetic field is completely off. Okay, so this is what we call a sudden quench. Is there anyone that doesn't know has ever has never heard about a sudden quench? Apparently not. Oh, somebody is waiting. Soon. I haven't. Okay, Edward, good. But was it clear what I said? So basically. If you haven't heard of it, just a sudden quench procedure is what I said. So you prepare your system, either quantum or classical, it doesn't matter. By the way, the word quench, I think it, it, it derives from what the blacksmith does with the sword. No? When you want to forge a sword, you first have to heat the metal. So the metal has to become very flexible and the, you can shape the mold. And then when you when you are ready, so when the, when when you make, you gave the metal the shape you want, you have to put it into cold water. You have to cool it down very fast. And this procedure, I think in English or in, in old English was called a quench, as what we, and it's for, an, by analogy, we use this in physics to mean when we take a system and we switch very fast the Hamiltonian. So it's basically the idea, no? of lowering the temperature very fast by putting the hot metal in cold water is the same that happens here. No, we, we take the system that is fully magnetized along the transverse magnetic field axis and suddenly we switch the magnetic field off and the system has to find a new equilibrium. Very well, so the system has to go and find a new equilibrium and this equilibrium Okay, the equilibration of an isolated quantum system is a little bit of a tricky question, but don't, let's not talk about the system in general. Let's talk about an observable. Let's, take, let's talk about the magnetization observable. So this is something that should be easy enough. 
As we say that the, the magnetization starts at t equals zero, which is basically one, because the system is fully polarized along the ma magnetic field axis. And then at time t equal to zero, the magnetic field is suddenly switched off and the system has to evolve according to the new Hamiltonian, the new quantum Hamiltonian. The initial state was an eigenstate of the initial Hamiltonian, so no evolution was taking place. But in the new Hamiltonian, the initial state is not an eigenstate, it's, it's just a product state, and the evolution starts. So the observable starts to evolve, and it does what you will expect it to do. So it decreases, it has some bounce back. This is a phenomenon that we will talk about in a minute. And then there is some decoherence and the observable equilibrates to its expectation value to the, in the final state, no? The final Hamiltonian has no magnetic field. And then we expect it to show no transverse magnetization. And this is indeed what happened to the observable. It equilibrates and it goes to its expected equilibrium value. As long as the system is finite, this equilibration can never be perfect. It exists a phenomenon that's a phenomenon that's also known in classical system, which is, was the reason why a lot of people opposed Boltzmann description of statistical mechanics in the, in the beginning of the century, well, in the beginning of the last century. Um, and, it was, and it is that a, a closed system always comes back to the initial condition after an exponentially long time. This phenomenon is called Poincaré recurrence time. Unfortunately, it's not visible in this uh, plot. But what you can imagine is that as long as the system size is finite, there will be at some point at very large time a, a, a new revival of the dynamics, which goes up and then it goes down again. This is the concept of a Poincaré recurrence time. But what Boltzmann said to, to oppose the criticism that was led by these many people, especially Zermel and other people, is that this Poincaré recurrence time exists, they are a thing, but they, ve they become exponentially large in the thermodynamic limit. And as they become exponentially large, we are allowed when we treat a statistically big system, so a system that has an Avogadro number of particles, to discard this Poincaré recurrence time and to basically treat the system as, it is, as if it is ergodic, as if it follows the hypothesis of the H theorem. Uh, did you know about this controversy between Boltzmann and uh, Zermel also? Well, I guess you know about the story, no? that the theory of Boltzmann was never, was never really accepted by the people at this time. No? They were opposing him. And one of the reasons of this opposition is, is what I have described right, right now. OK, so I think you, you I hope you got this point. It's, this is a feature that has nothing to do with long-range interaction. So this plot in here, it's representing the evolution of a system with short or weak long-range interaction. So alpha larger than one. No, so obviously as a function of alpha, the situation will be a little bit different here and there, but this picture here re re refers to the case alpha larger than one, where the observable starts in the initial value, and then evolves towards the equilibrium value quite fast. And it basically stays at equilibrium forever, apart from some exponentially large time, which is washed away in the thermodynamic limit. Now, this is equilibration as we know it in local systems. And it also works in weak long range interacting systems, so alpha larger than one. But we may now want to consider the case of long-range interacting system where alpha is smaller than one or smaller than b and see what happens to the equilibration. So we do the, sa the exact same procedure. So we start with the system fully polarized in the, uh, in the 
full uh, magnetized state, so where all the spins are aligned with the magnetic field and the state is a product state. And then we quench the Hamiltonian into a final Hamiltonian where the magnetic field has been turned off and we look at the evolution. And now this lower panel refers to the long range interacting case, to the case alpha smaller than one. And you see that it's, it's a very different from the, from the case of um, short range interactions because it starts at one and it stays there for for quite a long time. Now you see here, it, it was not staying at one at all. So you don't even see one because my time axis starts from one and not from zero. So this, this one, the one here would be somewhere here. And then it's very fast in equilibrating. Here it, it persists in, in the initial value for quite a long time. And then it starts going down and equilibrating towards the equilibrium value. As we increase the system size, as the system size got increased, so you see this this um, this blue curve is ten to the seven spins. The, the so as the shade of blue gets darker, the number of spins grows. All the curves were identical in here, so it's not that here I'm plotting just one curve. It's just that all these curves here in the short range case they collapse on each other, but in the long range case they do not collapse. But actually, as they increase the system size the magnetization persists for a longer and longer time on its initial value. And I can tell you, if you get it longer and longer, the chain, the longer the chain, the longer you stay in the initial value. And this is basically the, the old mark or the, the basic evidence of quasi-stationary states. So a state which persists in its, uh, which persists and it's not basically influenced by the dynamics for, for a very long time. And this time grows as the system size grows. Has everybody clear the difference between the short range physics and the long range physics? I think it's very stark, but please make some question on this point if you're missing anything. I do not see questions, uh, Nicolò, you can... Very well. Okay, so if you are, are, are sure about it, let's, let's proceed. And let's ask ourselves, what is the mechanism that generate these quasi-stationary states, no? So I told you there are these quasi-stationary states. I showed you one evidence. You have to bear in mind that this evidence is quite unique because this is the only quench we can treat. So we cannot do a quench between two finite values of H. We cannot. We can only do quenches from H equal to infinity to H equal zero. This is the only case that we can treat analytically. All the other things we have to treat in numerically. So no way we can get a signature at such large sizes for, a, for any quench. Only this peculiar quench it's special and can be solved analytically. And the reason for that is that the initial state is a product state and the final Hamiltonian is a classical Hamiltonian. You see the initial state is a product state because H was so big that we discarded interaction. And so each spin, the, the, the state of each spin was not influenced by the neighbors. Everybody was behaving on his own and aligning with the magnetic field. And the final Hamiltonian is classical because if I turn off H, I on, I'm only left with an Hamiltonian which is sigma x, sigma x. And so there is no non-commuting term in the Hamiltonian. In this sense, we say that the final Hamiltonian, the one with, with H equal to zero is classical. Because when you remove this term, this guy alone is there is no non commuting term in the Hamiltonian, and so it's basically a classical Hamiltonian. But we expect quasi stationary states to be much more general and to be observed also in, in different scenarios, not just in this simple example. But in order to show that, in order to understand that, we have to ask ourselves the question what is the mechanism of the root? And the mechanism of at the root, or at least uh, the core mechanism, there may be other ones, but 
the fundamental aspect of quasi-stationary state emerge if you look at the Fourier transform of long-range interactions. In the lecture of yesterday, if you remember, I mapped the Ising model into a bosonic model. So this was the spin wave approximation. And in this spin wave approximation, the dispersion of the spin wave is proportional to the Fourier transform of the coupling J, VIJ. Sorry, here I called it VIJ and I called it JIJ later, so this guy. But this JK is nothing but the Fourier transform of VIJ. And yesterday, you should have, from the lecture of yesterday, you should remember that the, the Fourier transform of the VIJ, that unfortunately is now called JK, it's the dispersion relation of the spin waves. And if you remember yesterday, we talked about this dispersion relation and we say that this dispersion relation is non-analytic as long as alpha is larger than one. But let's now try to do the calculation for alpha smaller than one. And for alpha smaller than one, we cannot forget that we have to introduce a scaling factor, one over n to the alpha, the cast scaling that de depends on n. And now something very peculiar appears. This, was, this is really peculiar, at least for me, because I know a lot about tight binding Hamiltonians in condensed matter. And, and, and what happens here is completely the opposite. So the presence of long range interaction it makes it very different from the standard case. When you try to compute this Fourier transform, you find out that this Fourier transform is discrete. But it's not discrete because the system is finite. It remains discrete in the thermodynamic limit. You see, I am taking the limit n to infinity here, the thermodynamic limit for this result. We take, I took the thermodynamic limit for this result, and you see that as I take this thermodynamic limit, the Fourier transform is discrete. This is in strong opposition with the case of short range interactions where the Fourier transform becomes continuous, becomes a Fourier transform, <laughs> sorry, where the Fourier, where the Fourier series becomes, a, a, becomes continuous in the, in the thermodynamic limit. Here it does not. Here, the spectrum of, this, of the quasi-particle, the spectrum of the spin wave, it's discrete in the thermodynamic limit. And it's not just that it's discrete, as I, because this, will, this may be surprising to say that's discrete because normally what we are used to, uh, to understand is that if we take a finite chain, we do the mode of decomposition, we write, the spin wave approximation and we count the modes, we have a spin wave for each side. No? The number of degrees of freedom, the, the, the Fourier transform is a linear transformation. So the, the, the number of modes should be the same. And so in the thermodynamic limit, it's people normally understand that as you add more and more sides to your system, you are, add, you are adding more and more modes to your Fourier to your momentum descriptions. And these modes in the standard case of short range interactions, they go in between and they fill up the entire spectrum until the spectrum becomes continuous. But in the case of long range interaction, that's not the case. As we increase the system size, we add more and more modes, but all these modes are added in the, at the top of the band. So sorry. I say the top and indicate the bottom, but this is because this is J, but my, uh, my Hamiltonian, if you remember, has a minus in here, okay? So the actual spin wave energy is minus Jn. So this is the top of the band and this is the bottom of the band. So we add more and more modes to the system and the modes do not go in the middle and fill up the band. No, they go only at the top of the band and they accumulate at high energy. So this shows you that somehow in the thermodynamic limit, the summation over the modes is dominated by these points. It becomes flatter and flatter. It's like if there is no dispersion relation in this, in this model. 
basically the mod, any mod with alpha smaller than one in the thermodynamic limit, it looks like a fully connected model. It looks like a model that has only one mode because all of the modes become degenerate in here and the non-degenerate mode, they are washed away in the thermodynamic limit. We can understand the consequence of this if we do a simple, very, very simple example. And uh, it would be great if you already tried to do this calculation in the case of nearest neighbor interactions, but maybe you didn't. So let me try to outline how the calculation works. We consider an example that's much simpler than the one of the Isley model that I've done before is the example of a single particle hopping on a one dimensional lattice. It's a single particle. No, there is no interaction whatsoever. The single particle can hop on a chain and each of the state, each of the sites in the chain, they have an orbital. So there is an orbital that's fully localized on these sites. And there is some hopping matrix that allows you to tunnel from one orbital to another. This is just a so-called tight binding Hamiltonian, no? And now let's imagine what happens when I put a particle at t equal to zero, I say that the particle is fully localized in one of these eigenstates, in one of these states. Let's say it's fully localized in the orbital zero. Well, we know that the orbital zero is not an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, no? Because the Hamiltonian couples orbitals at different sites. So what will happen is that the, the particle will evolve, it will diffuse. And if you ask yourself, what is the probability of finding the particle in zero at time t, you may want to compute this quantity that I call the fidelity and also some other people call the fidelity, no? It's the initial state evolved with the evolving operator, which is e to the minus ht in quantum mechanics, and then sandwiched with the initial state. Now you see this. Is there anybody that doesn't see that this number gives me the probability to find the particle at zero or in the state psi at any time? OK, good. It seems that everybody is getting this. No, this is just standard, very basic quantum mechanics. You start in the state psi, you evolve with the evolution operator, and you ask the question, how, what is the overlap between the evolved state and the initial state? And this is what we call the fidelity at time t. Well, as I say, the initial state is just any orbital I choose zero for my example. So the particle started in here and then it evolves. And if we want to compute the, the evolution of the particle, we need to use the eigenstate. And the eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is translational invariant, the eigenstates are just plane waves. So they are just the Fourier transform of the atomic orbitals, not the block function, which are nothing but the Fourier transform of, of the atomic orbitals. Uh, so when we compute the evolution, what we do is that we decompose the initial state, which was just a single orbital, into the basis of the block functions, which are Fourier compositions of the atomic orbitals. And we compute the sum over the energies of the plane wave states. So this key, which is nothing but the square root, or, well, not the square root, but you see, is just this guy without the square, with, without the modular square. This key is just the sum over some time independent probability, which tells me what is the overlap between my initial state, what is the projection of my initial state on the plane wave eigenstate. So this pi is the projector. This Pn is the probability, as I say, that my 
the overlap between my initial state and the plane wave states. And each of these P evolves with the energy of the state of the plane wave state of the corresponding plane wave state. And so the key is the summation over N over all plane wave states of this uh, evolution. So now what do you, do you physically expect that's going to happen? So the particle starts in here. The state, the orbital state, the single orbital state, it's not an eigenfunction of the Hopkins Hamiltonian. So it evolves, it evolves. And what happens to the particle? Well, the particle is, start, is going to diffuse. It's not a classical diffusion. It's a quantum diffusion. But it's, the wave function is going to get lost more and more. No? It's gonna, the overlap of the wave function with, with people with the orbitals further and further away from the initial orbital is going to grow. And the particle is going to tunnel further and further away from the initial state, from the initial orbital. Now, as it tunnels further away, it can also tunnel back. And in some sense, this probability measures the probability that the particle is tunneling back so that that you find this is the probability that the particle that started here and started this quantum diffusion is back on the initial state as a time t. As I go to the thermodynamic limit, if the hopping is short range, remember that here I'm talking about a nearest neighbor hopping, it can only hop to nearest neighbor sites. As I go to the thermodynamic limit, so as I add more and more states to the chain, I add more and more energy. This energy is En become dense, and this, sum, this summation becomes an integral over the energy, and the, and the chi goes to zero. Because in the thermodynamic limit, the spectrum of this plane wave state becomes continuous. And as the spectrum becomes continuous, the limit as t to infinity of chi becomes zero. That means that the particle is completely lost. No, there are so many sites in the chain that the particle is tunneling further and further away, and it cannot come back. And so the probability of finding it back in the initial orbital vanishes. This is a mathematically exact statement. So mathematically, you can prove that no matter what are the en, as long as they become a continuous ensemble, they, this summation has to satisfy that this limit goes to zero. And it's also satisfied some other properties, which are a bit more general, but this I don't want to talk about to you now. For the moment, I want you just to grasp this basic point. A particle hopping on a lattice starts localized in, an, in a certain state. It diffuses because the, the Hamiltonian is a hopping Hamiltonian, a tight binding Hamiltonian. Its evolution depends on the spectrum of the Hamiltonian and the spectrum of the Hamiltonian becomes continuous in the thermodynamic limit. Due to the fact that the spectrum is continuous, the probability to, for the particle to come back to the initial states at long time vanishes. Is this clear for all of you? It's, Anyone that's this is not clear, I will repeat it, or we, you can ask some question. We can clarify. Uh, Nicolò, I have a question, so may, maybe you can clarify. So because you mentioned yes. that it's a quantum diffusion, uh, uh, not classical diffusion. In which sense? Uh, uh, in which sense? So can you be more precise? So, I mean, in, in, the, in the sense, of, I'm just saying. What I mean is just this is this, this dynamical evolution. Well, this dynamical evolution is mediated by the Schrödinger equation, so it's a completely conserving evolution. And in some sense, you can classically represent it as a particle which has a certain probability to be back. And in this case, it's completely class. So you it, you are representing it as a classical system, but from the quantum point of view. The, there is a wave function that is becoming flatter and flatter. So what's what's really happening is that the the, the probability to find the particle in each of the sites has become all equal for all of them. Well, I, I guess that's uh, that's just a difference in understanding. You can map this 
you can do as usual the the trotter decomposition and this will become exactly a classical diffusion problem okay thank you it's just a question of point of views no so when, you, when i say that it's a quantum diffusion it just mean that it's it follows the evolving operator of the schrodinger equation so the coherent evolution of the schrodinger equation is not some langevin or some some brownian motion but you can map it on a brownian motion so if you do trotter decomposition you will see that the mapping is on a brownian motion so in this perspective you can also say that it's the same thing some other questions even more basic Okay, so I hope that's clear. It, the example is very simple and I really, in some sense, uh, I encourage you to do this calculation. It, it's, it's a simple calculation. If you know base, very basic quantum mechanics, it's, it's very easy to do. Just consider a chain of orbitals. Each side has an orbital centered on it. Uh, and you say that this is the Hamiltonian and you compute what's the probability for a particle that has been placed in this orbital to come back at time t. And you would say that this probability goes to zero as you make the thermodynamic limit and the large time limit. Now that's enough for nearest neighbor interaction. Let's go to the long range case. Let's go to the case in which the hopping is not just between nearest neighbors, but I can hop very far. And this is what we have been talking about for the entire uh, course somehow. What happens when we generalize our knowledge of local system to a case in which the system is non-local? And this is somehow an example, super simple. Uh, this is a super simple example that the the hopping is, so it's not, it, some people won't even call this long range interaction because this is not an interaction effect, it's a hopping effect. So the particle does not interact with anyone, it's alone, but it, it, it can tunnel and it can tunnel further and further away with respect to the case of nearest neighbor hopping where, she, where the particle could tunnel only between uh, nearest neighbor sites. So now it's the same problem as before, exact same condition, all of the same, just the tunneling coefficients are now not vanishing for sites which are further than one on each other. They are all finite. And they decay as a power law, you know it very well. So the, the tunneling coefficients decay as a power law and alpha is smaller than one. The only thing that changes it's the spectrum, no? This is what I've told you before. Nothing has changed as of now. Only the spectrum has changed. All the calculation follows identically to the case of nearest neighbor interaction, but the energy of the spin waves is not becoming continuous anymore. It's, it's staying discrete in the thermodynamic limit. Exactly for the effect I was saying before, no? I told you that the Fourier transform of the V is discrete, is not continuous in the thermodynamic limit. And since it's not becoming continuous, it's remaining discrete. We cannot apply the riemann lebesgue lemma, which was giving us this result. We cannot apply this mathematically exact result we rather have to stay with a discrete spectrum. And for a discrete spectrum, when you do this summation, the probability will not vanish at large time, but it will remain finite. The function ft, it's an almost periodic function. And so it, it doesn't converge to any limit. It will continue 
it, well, it can also converge to some limit, but in most of the cases, it will continue oscillating internally back and forth. This is really a consequence of having a finite Poincaré recurrence time, no? This phenomenon, it was just the, the, simple, the, the simple statement that this closed system has infinite Poincaré recurrence time, while this closed system has finite Poincaré recurrence time. But what's intuitively the reason for that? The intuitively the reason for that is that, as we say, this is a tunneling process, so it's, it can be seen as a classical diffusion, as we just said, in which the diffusion is, is mediated by quantum fluctuations. So it's, it's the Schrodinger dynamics that makes the tunneling happen. The particle starts here, it starts hopping and get lost. And if the chain is infinite, it can never come back. It gets lost and it can never come back. This is uh, true only if the chain, sorry? Nicolo, if, you, if there is time after your talk, I would like, uh, since we are uh, in the last, uh, mm -hmm. almost the last day of the week, I would like to propose a discussion among the students about the Poincaré recurrence time. Absolutely. So do we, you we agree can do this that uh, we might uh, maybe ask Absolutely. the student, uh, because I, I think it's, uh, what do you think, Panteo? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So because I think I this think, is exactly I think what I had in mind. Okay, we are at the end of our lecture course. I can propose a more uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think innovative I can way of interacting with the students. So to know, to know. So what is wrong about the theorem of Poincaré? So, <laughs> so he proved it. He made a big effort, and then you are saying. Uh, is wrong in some uh, in some sense. Oh, no, no, it is just wrong. In, it's not wrong in the sense uh, he is correct. It's just that the hypothesis do not extend to to long. Okay, grade, okay, to long okay. Grade. Let's discuss these. Uh, which are the hypotheses and so on? Okay. So, but uh, it, okay, very, just, I, I think I'm, it's a very interesting uh, point that you are making uh, with this. By yeah, the way, and it's this, also, I think, this, uh, this paper by Nicolò is published, I make a little bit of advertising since it's your last talk and you did the effort of, of talking from Boston. This paper of Nicolò is published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And so it's uh, very, uh, and he published alone on this, uh, on this issue. So, so it's a very important uh, remark that he did. So go on, Nicolò, don't feel too much uh, pleased. Uh, <laughs> so, we will so now basically, with, uh, with uh, Poincaré. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, well, basically somehow this is already, we, we could already say that we have done. I, I wanted just to once again invite you, um, for example, I myself, so sorry, I cannot find what I wanted to show you. Ah, this is what I wanted to show you. So I myself, uh, I studied quantum mechanics quite a bit. Uh, when I was uh, in, in during my master studies, but when I started working on this topic, I found myself that I I needed some more background, and I wanted to show you this paper. It's not as you see; it's it's kind of old. It's I don't think it's not even a paper. It's more of a chapter of a book. It's a it's very mathematical in style. But I encourage any one of you that is interested in quantum theory, that is interested in quantum mechanics, to go and have a look at this paper because it will show you, it will make a summary of all the known results, exact mathematical results about quantum mechanical evolution, and really show you how this, if the spectrum is continuous, so he said it, well, he says it a little bit everywhere, but you see, you basically, any Hamiltonian, any Hilbert space of an Hamiltonian, you can decompose it into absolutely continuous, singular continuous, and pure point. So this is really a statement which is generic about Hilbert spaces, that you can decompose the Hilbert space on Hamiltonian into, into sectors, and there is continuous sector, pure point spectrum, while singular continuous, as, as we were saying with Stefano some time ago, it's not so common. Uh, when you do this decomposition, you can really see that what I told you, it's somehow a bunch of exact results because the riemann lebesgue lemma is just a statement that any Fourier transform of the spectrum has, 
as gonna go to zero as t, the parameter of the Fourier transform goes to infinity. And this is what happens here, no? This is just the Fourier transform of the spectrum because the Pn, this Pn in here, for a, for a state that is fully localized is gonna be one everywhere, no, not one, one over n. They are gonna just be identical for each uh, plane wave. So this Pn really doesn't enter in the computation. What this computation is, is just making the Fourier transform of the spectrum, of the spectrum in the Hilbert space. And so you can really apply this bunch of mathematical exact results, not only to, to prove what I said, but to prove a large number of other theorem like this Rage theorem, which involve also that the average of more complex operators that not just the fidelity have to vanish. So there is a lot that can be learned from just looking at the spectrum of this system. And whether this, we can call this spectrum of the system pure point is still a bit to be seen, but still you can use a bunch of mathematical results. And from these simple things, you can already understand a lot of why long range interactions are so different from the case of local systems. Okay, very good. So basically, so, so Nicola, this was if you allow me, I, I would like to point out a, pro a property so of the short range versus long range of the example that you have made. Okay, mm -hmm. essentially, in the example of short range, uh, can you show uh, uh, the matrix, uh, the matrix that you have to uh, diagonalize is uh, three diagonal. So there are elements only in, on the diagonal and on the diagonals that are close to diagonal. Okay. And of course, you know how to diagonalize such matrices, okay? It's just uh, the matrix is uh, commutes with the translation operator. So you, the, eigen, uh, the eigenfunctions of the translation operator are waves, are standard waves, okay? So then you apply the matrix to the eigenfunctions that are standard waves and you get the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are the EK that, uh, that uh, Nicolò is uh, showing here, okay? Now show the other matrix. The other matrix is, uh, uh, is no more tri diagonal, okay? But it shares the property uh, of being uh, diagonalizable in some cases, because uh, it is, uh, in some cases, you, if you have a, so I don't know which example you it's were basically, making. It's basically, it's always a toplitz matrix. So toplitz matrix are just a way that the mathematician used to say something which is translational invariant, no? Okay. That the, the, the entries of the matrix only depends on I minus J. So if the entries of the matrix depends on I minus J, they are always diagonalizable because it's like if the system is translational invariant, you know that the eigenstates are plane waves. So this is, these statements can be made mathematically. So the, the pi k that you see here are exactly the same again functions of the previous example. Exactly what is different, the same. What is different here is the values uh, of the eigen, of the eigenvalues, are the eigenvalues. And uh, so, uh, so, so that's the fortune, that the lack of uh, this example, because uh, you know the eigenfunctions, so, so it's not, uh, it's possible to do the calculation because you know the, you know the eigenfunctions. And, but this uh, difference, you, you have a model with the same eigenfunctions, but with different spectrum of eigenvalues, makes a big difference in the behavior of the fidelity in the return to the, to the initial states. Okay, sorry, Nicolò, I wanted to, to make... No, it. no, it's very good. Uh, the more we repeat, I, I think it is, uh, this in some sense, it's advanced because it's on long-range interaction, but it's also very basic. No, it, it, it entails a lot of concepts which are from standard quantum mechanics. So already getting until here, it's a lot of knowledge that you need from quantum mechanics, but it's knowledge you will use a lot. And this example, as Stefano was saying, it just violates the common law because it's no local and the entries of this matrix, they are, the matrix is not anymore be a three diagonal or a, so normally matrix that we treat in quantum mechanics, they have non vanishing entries only close to the diagonal. While this is different because it's a full matrix. I didn't find so many mathematical 
results about it. I was a bit surprised, but maybe in the future we will make some. To really show that when the matrix is full, you need to have some conditions on the decay of the, of the entries of the matrix at far from the diagonal in order to get a continuous spectrum. Well, this is maybe too much advanced. For the moment, you just remember full matrix, discrete, um, discrete spectrum, sparse matrix or tridiagonal matrix, continuous spectrum. Okay, I wanted to make just one more example, but uh, I'm not gonna, so I'm not gonna want to spend too much time on it. It's a slightly more complicated because it's, it's now not just one particle hopping on the lattice, it's many, many fermions. And they are not just hopping, they are also have this non-conserving term that we were talking about yesterday. So this is again the model I was talking yesterday about. It's a model of fermions hopping on the lattice with non-conserving, uh, non non-density conserving operators. It's a model of superconductivity that can be also related to the Ising model as I showed you yesterday. This is not as much important for you. I, we, you don't need to know at this stage in your academic uh, trajectory how to solve a such model, which is a bit complicated. Well, it's not really complicated. It's still just a Bogolubov transformation, but it's anyway some many body Hamiltonian. What's it's interesting anyway, that even in this many body model or pseudo many body model, the presence of a hopping matrix, which is long range, which does not decay, decay fast with the distance, basically cause the appearance of quasi-stationary states. And since we want to discuss a little bit in a few minutes, I want to just wrap it up, but I want just to show you that if I take an operator, which is just related to the density of the fermions, you see this MX, it's kind of the density of the fermions, no? This measures how many fermions are at a certain point, it's normalized. So if we consider just this operator, which is somehow related to the density of the fermions, and we compute its evolution after a quench of the H, which it's now the chemical potential of the fermions, we find exactly the same signatures that I've shown you for the Ising model. And again, this system, just this is just a consequence of the discrete spectrum. So if we do such dynamics between a large values, between a large value of the chemical potential to a small value of the chemical potential, we do the quench. So we change the Hamiltonian suddenly from HI to HF, that density operator will change its value will always start from one because I normalize it to be one at the beginning. But if the interactions are short range, you see something very similar as to the Ising model. It goes fast somewhere and then it starts oscillating and there is a day phasing for which it equilibrates at a certain value. And here you see the Poincaré recurrence time. Here on this axis, we finally have uh, an axis that is long enough to see the Poincaré recurrence time. So, sorry, let me make it bigger so you can see it well. So, you see, when the system is small, the guy does this kind of equilibration. You see the, the greenish line here. But then at a certain point, the dynamics starts back. This is a Poincaré recurrence time, no? And then it restarts oscillating and it goes, it flattens. As you increase the system size, the, the Poincaré recurrence time occurs later and later and later until it goes away from the axis, you see? And this is really how it, what happens also in the thermodynamic limit. As, as the more you increase the system size, the more this Poincaré recurrence time is pushed away to infinite times, basically, you, are, you achieve actual equilibration. And this is for alpha basically infinity, so nearest neighbor. Well, for alpha, that's a bit smaller, but still larger than one. So remember that this is the case alpha larger than one. It, 
you still see that if you increase alpha, this equilibration, it takes more time, no? You see, so if you decrease alpha, you see this is alpha, I think it's 1.5, so it's quite small, but still larger than one. You see, it takes more time, but the phenomenology is basically the same. You have a Poincaré recurrence if the system is small, and as you increase the system size, the Poincaré recurrences are washed away, and it just takes more time to reach some kind of equilibrium. This is strongly opposed to what happens for alpha, uh, for alpha smaller than one. For alpha smaller than one, this is alpha, I think this is 0 0.9 or something, 0 0.8. You see a finite size, the, the two curves are not so different. You start from one, it goes down, and it then starts to oscillate around some kind of value that you may mistake for an equilibrium. But the difference is that here, as you increase the system size, it doesn't stay, it doesn't converge as more and more to the same value. It's actually the opposite. As you increase the system size, oscillations kind of continue, but they are pushed closer and closer to the initial value. And they are pushed closer to the initial value the, the more the, the system is long range. This is alpha equals 0 0.5. And so this is again the phenomenon of quasi-stationary state. There is not well-defined equilibrium here because there is no unique value around which all the curve oscillate and converge. Rather, as you increase the system size, you get closer and closer to the initial value of the dynamics. You basically get a non-evolving system. Okay, this is what somehow my point. Uh, all of this is caused by the discreteness versus continuous spectrum. Most of this statement can be proven exactly by mathematical theorems. I do not want to tell you all of this because I would prefer to have some discussion. I just make this conclusion. Long range couplings, long, this is not even talking, as I said, about interaction. This is just long range hopping couplings have a spectrum which remains discrete to the thermodynamic limit. And this is, you can understand exactly the, the way Stefano said, it's just a full matrix that now you have to diagonalize. And this spectrum is different from the one that you will get from a tridiagonal or a fast uh, empty matrix. One can then study a system of particles with this discrete spectrum. And this, I say here, it violates the kinematical chaos hypothesis because basically what, it, what is happening in here is that due to the discreteness of the spectrum, there is no dephasing, no? Equilibration in the short range case comes from the fact that this guy becomes continuous. And so you are mixing a lot of different frequencies that are all close to each other, but all different. And this, they basically average to zero. The same is not true here because there is not this defacing. This defacing is called kinematical chaos hypothesis in some paper that I can send you if you wish. Uh, and so this is violated by this long range spin wave theory. As a consequence of these violations, do you have a finite Poincaré recurrence time in the thermodynamic limit? These Poincaré recurrence time are not even finite, but they kind of tend to zero. So they become very small, not zero. Well, they, they tend to become smaller and smaller as the system grows. Uh, another statement that you can make is that any system with, from this perfect perspective, any system with alpha between zero and one is basically identical to the case of alpha equal to zero, because the spectrum of the alpha equal to zero system will be just a single flat line. The, the different alpha, they are not flat, but as you go to the thermodynamic limit, they basically become flat because you have infinitely many states on the flat line, and you can basically discard the contribution for the few states which are finite, which do not belong to the flat line. Okay. This, I think, closes what I wanted to say. I want to say thank you and uh, 
we can have some discussion now if anybody is interested on, so on Matteo, the recurrent side. What do you think? We should have a break or we start a discussion? Oh, which obviously we can have a break before. So five, bre five oh, we can just break and then are you re are you available for discussion, uh, Nicolò? Yeah, yeah, five. Okay, so minutes we have so a five minutes break uh, and then uh, discussion.